Hello, my friends. If you are a like dedicated Giant Grant Games viewer from about a year and a half ago, you might recognize the footage in front of you. This is the uh, pre-alpha for StarCraft II, the uh, first like footage that they ever put out for the game. They uh, had one of these for each of the races. It was like a showcase for everything that was going on with the faction, uh, pre-release in order to get people interested, excited, hyped up, and all that kind of stuff. And, well, first of all, I don't have that VOD on the archives or anything like that. And I figure that, you know, the 150 people that were there, not quite the same sample size. So let's, uh, let's uh, check this out and do a little bit of a comparison on the broadcast styles for how Stormgate versus StarCraft decided to go and showcase stuff in the early stages. I'm not doing this because I'm like, oh, StarCraft is better, but because I don't really remember a lot about these, and I am genuinely curious to see if the Stormgate reveal, which was met with fairly middling reception across the board, was truly different in a lot of ways, or if the community has just changed their expectations. And if it was different, then... No, it doesn't necessarily mean one way is better than the other, but there definitely are things that could be learned. So I'm interested in seeing the differences here. And I just want to also see the old school StarCraft stuff because it's really cool. So uh, I want to apologize that this is going to be 720p video because this came out in 2010. And that's just what was the thing back then. <laughs> so I can't really, I can't really fix that. But let's just let's just jump right in and give it a go. First thing I like is just the fact that they showcase like the movement. I don't know. It is definitely kind of quiet. But I like the fact that they showcase the entire These are the Terrans. They're flying their buildings in to set up their base. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I just noticed at the top they have leet minerals and leet gas. <laughs> That's very funny to me. <laughs> Uh, I like the, uh, showcasing of the nomadic Terran lifestyle effectively. Do you know what I mean? Like, it really harkens back to StarCraft 1, which makes it more immediately nostalgic and identifiable. I think that's a really good call. Much as they would in the original StarCraft. Notice the command center here is holding five SCVs. This is a special new ability that allows the Terrans to rapidly expand or redeploy on the battlefield. You can see some buildings here that you may recognize. We've got our factory, which allows the Terrans. Oh, look at that. Look at that. The, sorry, the factory, it looks like it can build, is that landed Vikings? Landed Vikings, siege tanks, and diamondbacks. That's spicy. <laughs> I love it. To make a number of powerful vehicle units, we also have our barracks, which the Terrans use to create all of their infantry. You may notice there's some new add-ons attached to these barracks. The first of these add-ons is the tech lab. That is a lot of upgrades. Very interesting that they decided to really, really, really skim down on the number of upgrades that were available. Even in the release of Wings of Liberty, they had less than this, but they had more than they did today. Because there used to be stim pack, combat shields, uh, concussive shell, and the... Nitro Boosters, which was a movement speed upgrade for the Reaper. And eventually, Nitro Boosters was cut. And it, it's interesting seeing how many different options they had right now. Very fascinating that I kind of like that design philosophy where they just throw... They don't like have the, this unit does this, but they just throw a bunch of ideas on the wall. And then they play with it and cut out the things that don't really work. I think that that leads to more interesting designs generally. The Terrans use this to purchase high-tech upgrades. The Terrans also have a new add-on called the Reactor, which can be used to give an additional build queue to any building it's attached to. This effectively is doubling the production capacity of this barracks. Marine Medic Ghost. No fire bats. <laughs> this new add-on system also allows the Terrans to reconfigure their production on the battlefield. We can lift off this barracks and we can fly this factory into its place. So one thing that I personally was feeling when the Stormgate trailer came out is that 
I wasn't really thinking of all the crazy strategies that could be potentially done with the things that I was showcased. And one thing that I'm instantly noticing here is because they focus on these new systems and factional differences, it is, uh, it is different in that regard, right? So they're instantly like, look, you can swap these add-ons with anything. Instantly, as a player, there's like so many different options there, right? Like add-on swapping for build orders is one of the more complicated and skill rewarding for build order optimization plays that you can do as a Terran player. And they put that really front and center. And I think that's very interesting because it is pure strategy, right? It's not mechanics. We are about like a minute into this and there are no mechanics whatsoever that have been shown. It is just strategic level things and faction identity. You want a piece of me, boy? And once the factory lands, that factory will gain the benefits of that tech lab, enabling you to build a number of high tech. That is definitely the landed Viking. That is what it said. That's amazing. Uh, let, I want to go. I want to go see if we can read the tooltip for it. I downloaded the video because. I wanted to be able to reverse, uh, I want Factory to- will gain the benefits of that tech lab, enabling you to- Armored support walker, air combatant in fighter mode. Oh, heck yeah. Upgrades at the tech lab, fighter tech. Oh, interesting. So that's one of those things, siege tanks used to have a oh. siege tech as well. Yeah, right here. So it looks like what they actually did. Well, that's an expensive siege tank. 200 minerals, 125 gas, and 50 build time. Whoa, <laughs> what a bad unit. So one thing uh, that I'm kind of noticing here, just as a theme, is that StarCraft actually put a ton of things behind upgrades, and then over time they just cut upgrades over and over and over again. And they never really said anything like that in here, as far as I remember, which I could be wrong, I definitely could be wrong, but I find it very interesting that uh, they upgrade walled so many things and then peeled that back later. A number of high-tech vehicles and purchase vehicle related upgrades okay Dustin base defenses are still very important to the Terrans we've got our bunkers which of course will load up with our infantry are the bunkers two by two that first of all they're really ugly <laughs> so I think that this is definitely one of those things where it's like yeah you can give a visual pass on a lot of the stuff you see in pre-alpha because the, there's going to be art passes on it. And that is true for Stormgate. That is true for this. Like that is a really ugly bunker. It also looks like it's two by two, which reminds me of Minsk's bunkers. But Minsk's bunkers are like really, really tall and weird looking. These kind of look a little bit more normal, but they're still just not thick enough. In addition, the Terrans have a new base defense. This is the sensor tower, which the Terrans can upgrade into a radar tower. The regular sensor tower detects enemy cloakers. One thing I've noticed is that both on the tech lab, the reactor, and now the sensor tower, there is a salvage icon. What do you guys think about that? Do you think that Terrans should just be able to salvage, like, everything <laughs> and move around? It's very interesting that that never made it into... Wings of Liberty, the campaign, at least. If I had to make a guess, they may have gotten rid of the salvage ability because people were accidentally salvaging a lot of their stuff, right? So they'd be like clicking on their tech labs, try to hit a hotkey, salvage all their tech labs, and then lose the game. The bunker is the only thing that can be salvaged currently. And I wonder if that reason is because you can't salvage a full bunker, right? You have to manually empty it so it's a lot harder to accidentally salvage. That's really interesting. Does that model exist in StarCraft? Like, is that a thing that could be used? I've never seen like an arcade game or something use it. And I think that's kind of a shame because it doesn't look like a radar tower, but it does look like it could fire a laser. <laughs> But the radar tower allows Terran players to see enemy units moving in the fog of war. Oh this is a gosh. powerful new ability that allows the Terrans to detect approaching enemy attackers and prepare for enemy ambushes. Here they come! <laughs> really swings the Liberty Siege tanks just did 50 damage for no reason. <laughs> These definitely are those. 
it the they <laughs> they were a good unit. They were worth the 200 minerals. Another thing worth looking or hearing, I guess, is that the like audio design on all this stuff sounds way worse than it does at release. Sounds like stock stuff. The battle cruiser is back in StarCraft 2. Battle cruisers can be upgraded to have their own special, unique mega weapon. Each battle cruiser is upgraded individually. A popular choice is the Yamato cannon. See, see. The fact that this never made it into wings makes me so sad, right? So if they got like the armory upgrades, which is like, oh, I got missile pods and defensive matrix. But like the idea of customizing your battle cruisers is so cool, and I don't know how it didn't make it in. Uh, it's like this was such a good and cool idea that it literally is like the spark that then created stuff like the Tactical Arsenal mod. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like one of the coolest mods we've ever played. Blizzard was like, yeah, we came up with that idea. We didn't want to do it. Like, come on, Blizzard. Which does significant damage to single enemy targets. I love how contrived that is, by the way. <laughs> like, why would Blue Flare come in and double your mod of the radar tower when there's missile turrets and bunkers? Oh, what a bad player. That was actually, sorry, there was something else I noticed here that is kind of cool looking. Each battle cruiser is upgraded so watch, individually. Watch the popular gun. choice is the Yamato cannon, which does significant damage to single enemy targets. Not the Yamato gun, but after this. So it fired like a volley of six, and then it has an internal cooldown after that instead of being the rapid bombardment constantly that it is now. Yeah, look at that's a, that was a good like two seconds in between volleys, but look at how much damage those volleys are doing. This bunker's already on fire. So the so the battle cruiser was a much more bursty unit before, and now it's sustained damage with its auto attack. That's interesting. I wonder why they changed that because the battle cruiser, when it came out in Wings of Liberty, was a very bad unit. It was arguably one of the worst units in the game. It was very hard to get to, and when you got to it, you weren't really guaranteed to win, despite it being one of the hardest things to get to. The carrier was the same. Another way. Another powerful were very bad. choice is the plasma array. This is an area effect attack against enemy ground forces. I don't know why they got rid of that. It's so balanced. One thing I wanted to mention here that I think is really uh, cool and interesting is that these various weapon systems had visual differences, right? Like you can see the plasma torpedoes in their 720p glory here, as opposed to the Yamato cannon variant, which doesn't have them. To deal with these battle cruisers, we'll need to bring in our Vikings. This is a new Terran tactical air fighter. Built right out of the factory. It's armed with two powerful missiles that it can use to engage enemy capital ships. Dude, you could see the game struggling to render those missiles right there. There was like a dramatic frame chunking moment. That is phenomenal. Sorry, I'm just looking at the Viking. All it has is the ability to land right there. And a very ugly portrait, which I'm just going to keep covered. It's actually just like an ugly male adjutant. Viking can also deploy into an assault. Let me, let me become invisible for a second so you guys can see him in all of his glory. Which one is me? Uh, look at him. He's so hideous. Alt mode that allows it to move on the ground. You can imagine all the different ways that you can use this on the battlefield. Of course, you can use it to avoid incoming enemy aircraft fire. But you can also use this special assault mode to make devastating attacks on enemy bases. We're going to fly north now and look for our enemy base. And once we get into position, we're going to take our Vikings and we're going to transform them into their assault mode and continue the battle on the ground. Oh, I made myself invisible again. I wonder, so this is one of those things, first of all, this is played on normal speed, right? And I think that that's fine, having a showcase of what everything does be on a slower speed so that viewers can keep up, particularly new ones. I think in a more modern environment, playing it on fast speed instead of faster would be the good way to do it. 
But one thing I noticed is that he did click on the hotkey, and I wonder if that was intentional or if he just didn't know what the hotkey was. Because, uh, it, I, I don't know, it feels like it'd be smoother and more seamless video if he just hit the hotkey, but maybe it was intentional? I don't know, that's a really interesting one to me as a video maker, and I don't think that's interesting to anyone else. It's just me as a person who makes videos and has to think about these things all the time. There's a lot. The Viking is a very flexible unit. It does have some drawbacks. It's very vulnerable to counterattack from a dedicated anti-ground unit like these siege tanks. The Vikings would totally win this now because they have the anti-mechanical. Uh, that was simply too much firepower for our Vikings to survive and be forced to transform into our air mode and move away. To attack these siege tanks, we're going to bring in our new Terran gunship. This is the Banshee. It fires a volley of rockets at enemy ground targets. Wait, I thought we were fighting the siege tank. Oh, interesting. So the Banshee was super overpowered. Like, imagine that on a worker line. Just natural, <laughs> natural blasty AOE cannons on a cloaker. Oh, man. I feel really sorry for everybody that was in alpha testing. That must have been miserable. But once again, it's just showcasing, like, really, really cool, crazy, powerful things at the beginning. And if they have to be scaled back, they do get scaled back later. I personally prefer this method. Go! These aren't the same siege tanks. Oh, they are. Okay. <laughs> it's like, where were you going? Blast them, boy. Now, these Banshees are vulnerable to this Marine counterattack, so we're going to cloak our Banshees and engage them with our area effect missiles. Fortunately for us, those Marines have clustered up, which is exactly what you don't want to do against the Banshee. I like how it's just Marine Killing Simulator. <laughs> Every ability, the battle cruiser the kills Marines. A... The tank kills Marines, the battle cruiser kills Marines. These kill Marines, even the Vikings killed some Marines. The, if you watch this, probably your takeaway would be, man, all this stuff is really cool, except the Marine. That unit is going to be completely inviolable <laughs> when the game comes out. That turns out to be the best Terran unit. I love that so much. Sensor tower nearby, which is allowing him to detect our Banshees, and those missile turrets are engaging us. Well, the Banshee is very powerful against ground targets. It's just not tough enough to stand up to those missile turrets. And once again, we're forced to retreat. I like the triple sensor tower build. Oh, yeah. It's unbreakable. To continue this attack on the enemy base, we're going to bring in our Reapers. This is a unit that you may remember from our original announcement demo. He's got his jump pack, which enables him to traverse this difficult terrain. The Reaper, the Reaper really also has a new ability distance. you haven't seen yet. This is his demolition charge, which he can throw anywhere on the battlefield. The demolition charge takes a short time to go off. But once it explodes, Ooh. it can do dev. Ooh, one sec, one sec. Look down there. Hover is a unit type. And the magnetic mine has it. That was the thing that was in StarCraft 1, but didn't make it into StarCraft 2. I didn't know that any iteration of the game had hover as a unit type. That's very interesting. Battlefield. The demolition. Uh, in StarCraft 1, the way that it worked is that hovering things were immune to spider mines. And that's it, I think. <laughs> It was like, yeah, congratulations, Vulture Workers and the Archon. <laughs> I think that was it. It was it was weird. But good thing that the Magnetic Mines also have it. Charge takes a short time to go off. But once it explodes, it can do damage. devastating damage to static enemy targets. The Reaper is also very powerful against the enemy's economy. We're going to move our Reapers into position here in this SCV stream and start to destroy the enemy's economy. It looks like the Terran commander is responding by transforming his command center into a planetary fortress. This is a powerful wow. new Terran base defense that our Reapers simply don't have the firepower to deal with. Look at how fast that attacked. It, I think this is one of those things that, like, uh, I, I was saying, uh, pull back the coolness factor. You start out really high and then you do it back. But sometimes you design something and then in later iterations you're just like, you know what, no, that's wimpy. 
And I think that the modern Planetary Fortress gun is like really impactful and powerful, and I really like it. This one felt very weak in comparison. So I think that's a really strong change because it manages both to, I think that the modern one is pretty balanced, but also it feels way cooler. What? They have StarCraft 1 gas geysers. Look at that. They had like four guys in this geyser and they can't mine from it efficiently. <laughs> That's amazing. Like many Terran players, we have bases all over the map. As you can see here, our supply depots are blocking access into our base, preventing the enemy from closing with our siege tanks and allowing us to shell them from range. So that's actually one really interesting thing that hasn't scaled with time. If you watch any professional StarCraft Brood War, you'll know that it is not uncommon. For example, if there's a four-player map where there's uh, two bases here and here and then down, you know, it's a square, and there's uh, main bases in all the corners, then there's naturals coming out of that. Taking those other mains was not an uncommon thing. So you'd have, like, your cluster of bases up here, and then you'd take this one and then expand kind of back over. That's not how StarCraft II gets played, because the units are so quick to murder an entire base, and you cannot defend it properly with a couple tanks. Back in StarCraft Brood War, for example... Uh, the definition of indestructible was two lurkers and a defiler on top of a ramp. Just, I'm sorry, if you were a ground unit, you're not getting up that. But in StarCraft II, because things path so well, it is uh, just not a vi- And th they pass so well and the damage output is so high that it's uh, completely fallen out of favor. I kind of miss it. I like the idea of having bases all over the map. It uh, forced people to be exposed. So. It took a couple years for StarCraft to really figure out how to approach that. And by a couple, I mean it took like seven years. And eventually, the 12 worker start forced players to expand way faster. So instead of like taking this part, growing out, and then this part and growing into it, then this part, then growing into it, you just keep expanding outward and outward and outward, which I think is a fairly reasonable way to do it. Uh, it does... it. I, it's a little bit of a lost charm, though, in my opinion. Inside our fortified position here, we're going to use our SCV to build a new special Terran assault unit. This is the Thor. It's an assault unit so large and so powerful that it's actually built out on the battlefield. So cool! I love it. So it might appear that we are trapped inside our base, but in StarCraft II, Supply depots can be lowered into the ground into a special defensive position that allows our units to path over them. I just... And once we've moved through, we can raise our supply depots back into position to protect our siege tanks. The Thor is so cool, man. Like, okay. I really am feeling the difference because, like, I've been, I've been with this game for 13 years and I still watch this. I'm like, all oh, these ideas are sick! Uh, my thoughts aren't even like, oh, ha, ha, how quaint. It's like, man, I wish an RTS came out like this. <laughs> I, StarCraft 3 is looking pretty sick. Oh, he's so slow at rotating, too. Oh, look at him. He must feel awful to use. He's so clunky. What a guy. Now you may notice that the Thor has some additional guns on his back. I do. These special artillery attacks can be used against tough targets like this enemy planetary fortress. Imagine you're just playing a ladder game and they press the ability and it turns into a flipping cutscene. <laughs> I know that's I know that's not how it would work in 1v1, but like that's so fun. To me. <laughs> so good. Oh. oh, look at that guy. He's machine gunning. Go get a planetary fortress. Like everything in StarCraft 2, the Thor does have his weaknesses. Wait. This is the Cobra. This is a small. One sec. Go away, Diamondback. I need to look at that. Special artillery attack. He had 91 energy, and fortress. then he popped out of the cutscene with 102. So yeah, this they didn't give it an energy cost. I love it. 
It's so fair. I don't know how that didn't make it into release. The Thor does have his weaknesses. This is the Cobra. This is a small, fast Terran hover tank. It can actually fire on the move, and it uses his powerful rail guns to batter through the Thor's thick armor. Notice the Thor. I I like uh. I like this dynamic. I think it's really neat. I know that rotation speeds got massively buffed for everything on the release of the game, but I really like how they just thought all these various things through and came up with interesting designs based on these mechanics. I also like the Diamondback's attack way better than the Cobra. Cobra looks wimpy with its little turns plasties. very slowly. That's as fast as the Thor can actually turn. It makes the Thor very vulnerable to this kind of speedy attacker. This is definitely one of those ones where it's like, oh, we probably should have gotten a guy that could micro this a little bit tighter. Did they have like a bunch of diamondbacks on, or sorry, cobras on follow with each other, and then they had the f one in the front was being controlled? I think that's what they were doing there. <laughs> Which is weird, because it doesn't work if you try to do it with diamondbacks. But it looks like it does work with the cobra. If you have a bunch of uh, move command follows on Diamondbacks and you try to make a giant snake of death, it's really, really broken. And they just get clumbed, globbed up on each other. But it works really well here, which is a shame because uh, I want my snakes. Don't ask me why I know this. Now, in order to continue our attack on this enemy base, we're going to need to bring in some specialists. We really couldn't see making StarCraft II without including the ghost. I hear that. I'm all over it. <laughs> Our boy is not biological. His unit type is fleshy. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm here. The ghost in StarCraft II is far more powerful than he was in the original StarCraft. That's, like, not hard. The Ghost was a really bad unit in StarCraft. It cost way too much money. It had, like, negative 7 HP. It did basically no DPS. Lockdown was really good, and that was it. Nukes cost 8 supply. In addition to his personal cloaking field, the Ghost can use his sniper rifle to deal lethal damage to enemy biological targets. Hmm. Now that is interesting. So, in this version of StarCraft, Snipe was an ability that required you to channel at the target and then you did massive damage to it. It was then made into a really, really rapid ability that MVP, the uh, best Terran player in Wings of Liberty, he uh, completely broke and made Zerg an inviable race for about a week and a half <laughs> until it got removed effectively and it was changed back into this. That's interesting. So, in order to nerf the ability, they actually just went back to a previous design. It's still very good, if you ask any Zerg players that are playing currently. The Ghost also has access to a number of calldowns. You've already seen our nuclear weapon. Now we'd like to show you the drop pods. This special ability allows the Ghost to summon squads of infantry anywhere he wishes. Sorry, I was, I was checking out to see, like, I'm pretty sure that the way that that works is you, like, load people into the Ghost Academy, because... Let me... This special ability allows there is, the Ghost there to summon eight, the 79 squads supply. of infantry anywhere he wishes. Then they fire it off. And the supply drops when the drop pods appear, so I assume that it's basically creating new marines from marines that were loaded up into a ghost academy or something like that and then dropped down. They're not just free marines. That is still an insane ability. But how did they get up to 83 and then 82 supply? <laughs> That's my question. Their supply went up. They didn't spend any money. As you can see, the Terrans have a number. Wait, even the Marines killed Marines, in the and now the Marines are going to die. Number of new powerful units and some classic units with some new abilities. 
all of these add up into a flexible and powerful side that is more than a match for any of their enemies on the battlefield. Whoa, that starport looks bad. Like, my goodness. Powerful side that is more than a match for any... Look at that. That is horrendous. It is absolutely awful looking. It barely looks like a starport. Give their enemies on the battlefields of StarCraft 2. Ooh. Go get him, Thors. I'm voting on red. I mean, I saw the Thor. Thor is Himba, dude. Yeah, Thor is Himba. <laughs> uh. Okay, Marines, you gotta get out of here, dude. You gotta die. So, uh, I think that's the end of it. Oh, yeah, it's just telling us that this is, uh, StarCraft 1, or StarCraft 2. So, I think the thing that I personally was believing originally, and I learned here, is that when you have a little bit more of a curated and guided tour of what is going on with your game in the early stages, when you are talking about, like, all the cool stuff that is going on with the units, going on with the terrain, for example, in the example of like Stormgate's Light Forests. It personally makes me a lot more interested simply because it gets me thinking about all the various ways that you could utilize these tools, right? Uh, the way that the Stormgate release kind of went, in my opinion, is they showcased two good players utilizing a bunch of tools. But this was more of going through a tool belt and giving examples of how they could be used. And I think that it's uh, a lot more interesting, like you have a lot more in the realm of imagination, right? I, th I think that you want to capture imagination in the early stages of showing stuff off because there's going to be a million billion pro games as time goes on. But, I don't know, this is a very unique type of content that you just will never see again, but I think really, 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 really works as an introduction. And it just, it goes crazy, right? It doesn't care about balance. It doesn't care about fairness. All it cares about is making the most wild and wacky tool belt that you could possibly have, and then being willing to admit, yeah, okay, this tool was a little bit too crazy. Let's back off a little bit. And I like that. I really, really do. Because, as I said earlier, I'd be... <laughs> I want to play this version of StarCraft like I straight up do. It seems like a lot of fun. It seems pretty freaking crazy. And, <laughs> like, I don't know. I would really like to. And it's... That means it works. If the game, if I've played this game for 13 years, this is a 13 year old video and it still makes me go, oh man, I want to play that. I think that's what you got to do. That's how you want to approach these style of things. If you want to capture me as a viewer, I will completely admit that I am not the only person. I do not have the only taste, right? Uh, but I personally love this. I think it's so neat. And if you guys are interested, uh, do you want to watch the Protoss and the Zerg versions as well? I know that I rambled for a very long time here. Uh, it took 33 minutes to get through an 11 minute episode because I am a windbag. <laughs> I'm bad at reacting to things. But I think it's fascinating. I think it's really cool. And I just, I don't know, it just looks like a really fun game that they had then. Even if everything was dumb. But honestly, I think most games that are fun have a lot of dumb stuff. And that's kind of my conclusion there. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of whatever this was. And if you want to see more of it, please tell me in the comments, and I will do it again for the other two. If you're not as interested, then we won't. So I will see you guys tomorrow. Peace!